Hi everybody, welcome back to my video. This is um, the next part of the Love Dare Challenge. It is a 40 day marriage challenge and, um, and it's by Stephen and Alex Kendrick. And this is the beginning or the day 12 and it is called Love Let's the Other Win. Oh, and if you've missed my other videos, make sure that you stay to the end of the video and see the, my tags and the end videos and I'll share the other uh, videos there if, if you've missed them. Um, day 12 and it's Love Let's the Other Win. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And that is Philippians 2, 4. And it says, if you were asked to name three areas where you and your spouse disagree, you are likely to be able to do it without thinking very hard. And my three things that I thought of quite easily that David and I disagree on is um, about, well, he thinks that we disagree on how to care and discipline our dog Baxter it's mostly my dog because I had him before we got married but um, he thinks I'm too lenient on Baxter and I don't think I'm very lenient <laughs> I don't know I guess it depends on who you ask um, but yeah and also we also some of the things is how we discipline and uh, talk to James not the major things because I think that that would be a big deal if a big red flag if you don't agree on how to discipline your child these are just some of the little things that um, we sometimes disagree on and also um, it used to be well we just started a, a budget on how much we I spend at the grocery store when we go when I go to the grocery store to buy groceries for the week um, I think David thinks I spend too much on groceries, which I really don't, I personally don't think I do. Um, I don't, even though he used to work in a grocery store, I don't think he realizes how much things cost to be healthy, like eat healthy. Um, I think I could buy a bunch of junk stuff and it'd be a lot cheaper. Um, but I think he's sometimes surprised about how much the prices and so sometimes we disagree on that um but i try to buy you know store brand stuff and look for the cheapest stuff so sometimes i'm surprised how much it costs too but that's just how it is um yeah anyway okay so it, then it goes on to you might even be able to produce a top 10 list if you're given a few more minutes I didn't do that <laughs> and Sally unless someone at your house starts go doing some giving in these same issues are going to keep popping up between you and your mate sadly stubbornness comes as a standard feature on both husband and wife models defending your rights and opinions is a foundational part of your nature and makeup it is detrimental, though, inside a marriage relationship, and it steals away time and produ produ productivity. It can also cause great frustration for both of you. Granted, being stubborn is not always bad. Some things are worth standing up for you and protecting. Our priorities, morals, and obedience to God should be guarded with great effort, but too often we debate of repealing things like the color of a wall, paint, or the choice of restaurants. Other times, of course, the stakes are much higher. One of you would like more children, the other doesn't. That's not a problem in our house. I think we're done after this one that I'm pregnant with right now is here. I think we are done. Um, Thank you, Don. <coughs> anyway, some people do have issues. Some mates do have um, that problem. Um, I mean, I wouldn't, I'm not going to say if it happens that we wouldn't Water. keep the kid. <laughs> we definitely would keep it, but. <coughs> sorry. But anyway, neither of us are out to have more children. 
One of you wants to a vacation with your extended family. The other doesn't. We don't really have that issue either. These are just examples, but I'm just saying we don't because we both enjoy our extended family and go on vacation with them. One of you prefers homeschooling kids. The other one doesn't. One of you thinks it's time for marriage counseling or to get more involved in church while the other one doesn't. Um, I, even though Dave and I have lived in this town that we live in for like five years, um, I think we both would like to, we haven't gotten involved in a church yet. Um, I think that's important for both of us. So we want to do that. Um, though these issues may not crop up every day, they keep resurfacing and don't really go away. You never seem to get any closer to a resolution or a compromise. The heels just keep digging in. It's like driving in a parking, driving with the parking brake on. There's only one way to get beyond stalemates such as these, and that's by finding a word that's an opposite of stubbornness. A word we first met while discussing kindness, that word is willing. It's an attitude and spirit of cooperation that should per permeate our conversations. It's like a palm tree by the ocean that endures the greatest winds because it's knows how to gracefully bend and the one best example of it is jesus christ as described in philippians 2 5 through 11 follow the progression of his selfish love as god he had every right to refuse becoming a man yet he yielded and did because he was willing he had the right to be served by all mankind but came to serve us instead he had the right to live in peace and safety, but willingly did laid down his life for our sins. He was even willing to endure the gru grueling torture of the cross. He loved, cooperated, and was willing to do his father's will instead of his own. In the light of the amazing testimony, the Bible applies to us a one-sentence summary statement. Have the attitude in ourselves which was all, was also in Christ Jesus, Philippians 2, 5. The attitude and willingness, flexibility, and humble submission, it means laying down for the good of others what ha what you have that were right to claim for yourself. Um, That little paragraph, I don't know why it doesn't fit perfectly, but it kind of does. It reminds me of the what would Jesus do bracelets that everybody wore, and I think it was like the 90s. I don't know. <laughs> just, that just kind of reminded me of that. Anyway. All it takes for your present arguments to continue is that both of you stay enriched in unbending. But the very mo sorry, I don't know why I laughed at that. I think I was still thinking of what Jesus do um, bracelet. But the very moment one of you says, I'm willing to go your way on this one, the argument will be over. And though the falling through may cost you a few moments of pride and discomfort you may have had a loving lasting investment in your marriage yes but then i'll look foolish i'll lose the fight i'll lose control well you've already looked foolish if you have been bullheaded and refused to listen you've already lost the fight by making the issue more important than your marriage and your spouse's sense of worth you may have already lost emotional control by saying things that got personal and hurt your mate the wise and loving thing to do is to start approaching your disagreements with willingness to not always insist on your way. That not to say your, sp your mate is necessarily right or being wise about the matter, but you are choosing to give strong consideration to the preference as a way of value valuing them. In fact, your willingness to reconsider may cause them to loosen the resistance to you and recon reconsider as well. Love's best advice comes from the Bible, which says, The wisdom, wisdom that is from above is pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield. And that's in James 3.17. Instead of treating your wife or husband like an enemy or someone to be guarded against, start by treating them as your closest, most honored friend. Give their words full weight. No, you won't always see eye to eye. You're not supposed to be a carbon copies of each other. If you were, one of you would be unnecessary. 
Two people who always share the same opinions and perspectives won't have any balance or favor to enhance the relationship. Whether your differences are for listening to and learning from. Are you willing to bend to demonstrate love to your spouse? Are you refusing to give in because of pride? It, if it doesn't matter in the long run, especially in eternity, then giving up your rights will be a loving way to bring delight and honor to the one you love. It will likely be good for you and your marriage. Surrendering a battle may actually be the best way to a greater victory. Today's dare. It says, demonstrate love willingly, choosing to give in to an area of disagreement between you and your spouse. Tell them you are putting their preferences first. This says, what issue did you choose? What did you what did giving in cost you? How will this help you in the future? All right, stay tuned tomorrow and see how my day, today's dare works out for me. Hi guys, um, just let you know that I did not do the dare from yesterday uh, from Love Let's the Other Win, day 12. Well, I'll take that back. I did a while back. Um, I actually I took a little break from the love dare and um, had a baby and I've been taking care of her so I sorry <laughs> um, I've been taking care of her and I actually did do the dare excuse me I actually did do the dare and but I can't remember exactly what was said and how it was said um so i will do it again or next time hopefully we don't have another arg argument but you know that we will uh, everybody does um so i will next time i will demonstrate love by willingly choosing to give an area of disagreement between you well, me and David, and I'll tell, and I'll tell him that I'll put his pre preference first. I really wish I remembered what it was, but I'll do it again, and and I'll let you know next time it comes up. But um, now we're on to day thirteen, and it is love fights fair. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand, and that's Mark three twenty five. Like it or not, conflict in marriage is simply inevitable. When you tie the knot as bride and groom, you join not only your hopes and dreams, but also your hurts, fears, imperfections, and emotional baggage. From the moment you unpack from your honeymoon, you begin the real process of unpacking one another, unpleasantly discovering how sinful and how selfish each of you could be. Pretty soon your mate start, started to slip off your lofty pedestal and you off of theirs. The forced closeness of marriage began stripping away your public facades, exposing your private problems and secret habits. Welcome to fallen humanity. At the same time, the storms of life began testing and revealing what you, you're really made of. Work demands health issues, in-law arguments, and financial needs flared up in the varying deg degrees, adding pressure and heat to the relationship. The set off the stage for disagreements to break out between the two of you. You argued and you fought, you hurt, you experienced conflict, every couple goes through it. It is par for the course, you are not alone, but not every couple survives it. So don't think living out today's dare will drive all conflict from your marriage. Instead, this is about dealing with conflict in such a way that you come out healthier on the other side. Both of you together. The deepest, most heartbreaking damage you'll ever do or have ever done to your marriage will most likely occur in the thick of conflict. That's because this is when your pride is the strongest. Your anger is, uh, is hottest. You're the most selfish and judgmental. Your words contain the most venom. 
you made the worst decisions. A great marriage on Monday can start driving off the cliff on Tuesday if unbridled and conflict takes over and neither of you has your foot on the brakes. But love steps in and changes things. Love reminds you that your marriage is too val valuable to allow it to, to self-destruct and that your love for your spouse is more important than whatever you're fighting about. Love helps you in install airbags and set up guardrails in your relationship. It protects your oneness. It reminds you that conflict can actually be turned around for good and can result in ev even greater unity, not less. Married couples who learn to work wisely through their conflict tend to be much closer, more trusting, more intimate, and enjoy a much deeper connection afterwards. But how? The wisest way is to learn to fight clean by establishing healthy rules of engagement. If you don't have guidelines for how you'll approach hot topics, you won't stay in balance when the action heats up. Basically, there are two types of boundaries for dealing with conflict, we boundaries and me boundaries. We boundaries are rules you both agree on beforehand that apply during any fight or altercation. And each of you has the right to gently but directly enforce them if these rules are violated. These could include number one, well, we will never mention divorce. Number two and three, is something that we need to work on and it is we will not bring up unrelated items from the past and we also need to work on we will never fight in public or in front of our children yes we need to work on both of those um unfortunately um four we will call a timeout if the conflict escalates to a damaging level we would never hit that thankfully um, we will never touch one another in a harmful way. We've never done that either, thankfully. Um, we do need to work on, we will never go to bed angry with one another. Sorry, David doesn't, or David doesn't need to work on that. I need to work on that. David's always saying how he, we should never go to bed angry. And sometimes I'm just so angry or just so tired and I just don't want to talk about it anymore that I just want to go to sleep, but that's something I need to work on. Um, and last for we is failure is not an option. Whatever it takes, we will work this out. Then there's the me boundaries. Are rules you personally practice on your own? Here are some of the most effective examples. Number one, I will listen first before speaking. Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And that is James 1.19. The one who listens first can consistently has the advantage in a fight. You should always approach sensitive issues by respectfully asking questions rather than making assumptions or unleashing ac accusations. And I underlined assumptions because I feel like, I don't know, assumptions is just something that I've always, and David and I both always, it's like, you can't assume anything. <laughs> um, number two, I will deal with my own issues up front. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? And that is in Matthew 7, 3. If you quickly admit when you were wrong, apologize first. You disarm your spouse and neutralize the ammo that, you, they, that they were using against you while leading the way for them to deal with their mistakes as well. And that is something I need to work, I personally need to work on. And I want to say that again is quickly, excuse the cat again, quickly admit where you were wrong and apologize first. This will disarm your spouse and neutralize the ammo they were going to use against you while leading the way for them to deal with their mistakes as well. And number three, I will, sp will speak gently and keep my voice down a gentle answer turns away wrath but a harsh word stirs up anger and that's Proverbs 15 1 and people tend to mirror the enemy in a fight the more tense you get the more tense they get 
The more humble and tender you become, the more and humble the tender they will come. Let how you speaking by laced with love regardless of what you're saying. And I think David actually personally needs to work on that. Sometimes I, I tell him, I said, you don't quit yelling. <laughs> and he's like, I'm not yelling. I'm raising my voice. So I guess maybe we disagree on what yelling is. Or he just is loud. <laughs> Um, but also, I think he also notices it when he is actually getting angry with James. And he actually um, told me, thank you for telling him when he needs to be gentle or breathe. So, uh, he knows that that is something he needs to work on. And then it goes on to saying, fighting fair means changing your weapons, disagreeing with dignity, Building a bridge instead of burning one down. Love is not a fight, but it's always worth fighting for. And today's dare is talk with your spouse about establishing healthy rules of engagement. If your mate is not ready for this, then write out your own personal rules to fight by. Resolve to abide by them when the next disagreement occurs. If your spouse participated with you, what was their response? What rules did you write for yourself? So that is where I am now, and I will talk to David about it, and I'll get back to you and let you know what our response is. All right, I am going to go over the Day 13 Love Fights Fair Dare, and um, I said that I need to work on not going to bed angry, admit when I'm wrong, and apologize. Um, he actually, Dave, I talked to David, um, we had a, um, not an argument, just a little, I was frustrated, uh, with, I don't know, life right now, you know, you got the coronavirus going on right now, and so I was a little frustrated with this about, I don't even know what, I don't even know if I know what was, I was stressed about, but I, this kind of snapped David, you know, just kind of was just not the nicest, just said some things I shouldn't have said, and um, I came back and I apologized to David, and um, he he highly appreciated it when I told him sorry for snapping and him and saying some stuff that I shouldn't have said. I mean, I was just getting mad at him because I felt like he wasn't helping me with Hannah, our daughter, and but it was he wasn't doing anything wrong, and I still was just frustrated and got on to him. And later I came back and I apologized and so was, I'm sorry for yelling at you. Um, I'm not. It wasn't anything you did. It was and just me being frustrated. And I said I can't even really tell you what it is. Just life and doing it right now. So. And then today, that was last night, and today I, uh, we were talking about it again, he said thank you for, he actually very much appreciated it and thanked me for that, so, yes, yeah, so, I guess I wasn't really fighting fair, <laughs> but I did apologize for it. But then I, um, after doing this, the during the dare, I did ask David, and he said that he agrees with all that was said, especially not bringing up the old, um, unrelated items from the past, especially if it's unrelated because you just get more agitated, because um, wondering why you're bringing it up anyway. So, and he also said that he shouldn't go to bed angry, which. I agree too. All right, now we are on day 14, and that is Love Takes Delight. And it says, Enjoy life with the wife of your love all the days of your fle fleeting life. And that's Ecclesiastes 9 9. The world is constantly trying to tell you what's attractive and what's not, what's undesirable and what's not. They Piddle the latest products worn by models and movie stars, hoping you will yield your wallet and credit cards. I didn't think about this. I just thought about this. <laughs> um, 
even when I was in here writing um, what I usually write in this devotional, but I just thought of it. I remember um, probably not even that long, well, now it's probably longer than I think now, probably 10 or so years ago, I would get like a magazine I'm reading, like Cosmopolitan. I think that's the magazine I used to uh, read when I was single. Um, but yeah, I would, it would show like different outfits or clothes and what's popular right now. And I would actually go to the store and buy it because that's what was being told was popular and what was hot at the moment. And I just thought that as I was reading this. Anyway, back to um, the devotional. It says, but if you embrace the unrealistic standards of beauty, of size and shape and height and weight, you will spend your whole life never content with you in the mirror and always wishing your spouse looks more like the photos in a highly airbrushed ads. I feel that way about myself, not about David. I like the way he looks. Anyway, um, the good news is that you don't have to waste your life chasing fantasy. You, not the rest of the world, get to determine what is the most attractive and appealing to you. You can choose to enjoy and take overwhelming delight right now in the priceless treasure God has already given you in your mate, inside and out. Nothing is stopping you and you should. One of the most important things you should learn on your love dare journey is that you should not follow your heart. You should lead it. Don't let your feelings and emotions do the, the driving. You put them in the back seat and tell them where you're going. Newlyweds feel their love. They take delight in the one they call their spouse. Their affections are fresh and young and the hope of a romantic future lives in their hearts. However, you can have something just as powerful as the fresh new love. It comes from the decision to delight in your spouse and to love him or her no matter how long you've been married. And I underlined that, so I'm going to say it again. It comes from the decision to delight in your spouse and love him or her no matter how long you've been, to, been married. In other words, love that chooses to love is just as beautiful as love that feels like loving. In many ways, it is truer love because it has its eyes wide open. The scripture says that God chose to set his love on his own people, even though they lacked the size of merit of other nations. That's in Deuteronomy 7, 7 through 8. We must do the same. Left to selfishness and emotion will always lean towards comparing the weaknesses of our spouse to the strengths of other men or women. We'll think, my wife is not as respectful and radiant, or my husband's not as kind and considerate. But our days are too short to waste focusing on the shadows when we could be enjoying the sunshine. And I wrote, I know I have fallen to this before. So... That's not good. I need to work on that. Instead, it's time to lead your heart to once again delight in your mate. To decide that the person God uniquely made them to be is who you're choosing to love and enjoy. And I underlined that. So I'm going to read it again. To decide that the person God uniquely made them to be is who you are choosing to love and to enjoy. Surprise their uniqueness and remember again why you fell in love with this his eyes or his her personality and I underlined eyes or her personality because um, they are the two I actually fell in love with was Jane with James with David was his eyes and his personality so I thought that was funny that they had both those in there to take his hand and seek her companionship to desire his conversation to accept this person quirks in all and to welcome him or her back into your heart. The Bible does not say a man should marry the woman he loves. He should love the woman he marries. And I underlined that. So I repeat it. The Bible does not say a man should marry the woman he loves. 
he should but should love the woman he marries. It's not like you're born with certain preferences you're destined to operate from. You get to choose what you treasure. So if you're ungrateful and disapproving, it's because you chose to be. If you pick at your mate more than you praise them, it's because you allow selfishness into your heart to take over. You've led yourself into criticism. So lead your heart back out. Learn to delight in your spouse again. When you reset your love on your spouse and reinvest the t needed time and energy back into your relationship, you can watch your heart daily enjoy more of who they are. And I wrote, that's one of the reasons why I am doing this devotional. The Bible contains many romantic love stories, none more provocative than the eight chapters from Songs of Solomon. Listen to the way these two lovers take pleasure in one another in this poetic book. The woman, like an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. In his shade I took great delight and sat down, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He has brought me to the banquet hall, and his banner over me in love. That Song of Solomon 2, 3, 3 through 4. The man, arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come along, O oh my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret place of the steep pathway. Let me see your, you form, your form. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your form is lovely. And that is Song of Solomon 2, 13 through 14. Too sappy, too mushy, not for those who lead their heart and delight in their beloved. Even when the new wears off, even when she's wearing rollers in her hair, even when his hair is falling out, it's time to enjoy again, to laugh and to flirt, to dream again delightfully. And I wrote, I've heard that of people, teens, that weren't allowed to read Saul of Sol Solomon until they were married. Because I guess they thought it was too, their parents or whoever thinks it's too provocative. So they said, hey, you're not allowed to read this until you're married. Which I know a lot of teens are like, hey, let's go check that out and see what they're saying. But that's just something that popped into my head when I, um, every time I hear anything about Song of Solomon, I hear, I remember hearing that some People aren't, aren't allowed to read it until they are married. I don't know. I think it's a good thing for somebody who is dating for they know what to look or how they should be treated maybe once they are married. I don't know. Something to think about. Anyway, uh, today's there may be directing you to a real and radical change. For some, the move toward delight may only be small step away. For others, it may require a giant leap from ongoing disgust. But if you're, you've been delighted before, which you were when you first were married, you can be delighted again, even if it's been a long time, even if it's a whole lot has happened to change your perceptions. The responsibility is yours to relearn what you've loved, what you love about the one to whom you promised forever. And today's dare was. Purposely neglect an activity you would normally do so you can spend quality time with your spouse. Do something he or she would love to do or a project they'd really like to work on. Make the choice to enjoy your time together. And then it says, what did you decide to give up? What did you do together? How did it go? What new thing did you learn or relearn about your spouse? And... Um, I actually decided not to do social media on Sundays, and this is a way I can spend quality time with David and the kids, even though today is Sunday, but I haven't recorded anything in a um, long time, and I need to get this up for tomorrow, because <laughs> I'm trying to 
upload a video every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and occasional Saturdays. And I don't have anything for this week. Um, so I made that promise to y'all. Even though David and my kids should be more important, I have spent the majority of the day with them. So I'm doing just doing this as a real quick thing. So, because I wanted to get this up for y'all. But that is not exactly what today's dare was about. I'm going to keep working on that. Um, I'm going to neglect something that I really want to do. And make sure that... And do something that David wants to do too. But it kind of coincides with it, you know. I'm not going to be doing social media on Sunday. So I can just spend time all day with... David and the kids, which I just practically just repeated myself. Yeah. Okay. So that is the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and make sure that you hit that bell. And so you never miss any of our videos. All right. I will see you in our next one. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.